Oh, so we're supposed to continue. Well, thankfully, we've had some good rain lately. Yes. Good evening and welcome to the June edition of your Backyard Association, brought to you by the Coweta County Master Gardeners Extension Volunteers. I'm Alan Summerlin and with me, thankfully, every time we do this is Deborah Williams. The Backyard Association presents a monthly gardening program the second Tuesday of each month, with the exception of December. All programs are free and presented just for you. Master Gardener programs operate under the leadership and guidance of the University of Georgia through county extension offices. For information about gardening, water quality, family wellness, and life skills, Kerry to County Extension can help. You can contact us by phone, email, or on our website, which is on, the, on your screen right now. You can also go to our website to see presentations by our Master Gardener Extension volunteers. If you miss a presentation, just check our website and you can view a recording. Thanks to Karen Mansour, our Ag and Natural Resources uh, Program Assistant. She's recording the session tonight and it will be uploaded to the Coweta Extension website. So go to the website, scroll down to the Master Gardener Volunteer link to find our recorded programs. And you can see workshops like our recent pruning uh, video, our lawn care for homeowners workshop, and our backyard association events. Also find information about other upcoming extension events, health information, and great newsletters. On Tuesday, July the 13th <clears throat> at 7 p.m., <clears throat> the backyard association Excuse me, welcome Sarah Henderson. Sarah is the Director of Gardens <clears throat> for the Historic Oakland Foundation. She'll be speaking on unusual bulbs for fall planting. And we're so excited to have Sarah. Uh, we've had Sarah about four or five times and each time, no matter what the subject is, she is just full of great knowledge. And of course, this will be our re-entry into the live programs. Uh, and so we encourage you to uh, take a look at your schedule and we'll be sending out information uh, to sign up at the County Extension Office and, and, uh, and to sign up for the program, uh, which will be on Tuesday, July the 13th at 7 p.m. That's live. And I'm so excited. Yes.
Okay, we are excited to have Melanie Furr, the Director of Education at the Georgia Audubon Society, presenting our program this evening. Melanie develops and teaches numerous programs about birds for audiences of all ages and backgrounds. As a former high school English teacher, she particularly enjoys working with uh, educators to train them how to incorporate uh, the study of birds in their curriculum. Melanie is a licensed welfare rehabilitator and has volunteered at Aware Wildlife Center for more than eight years. Melanie holds a Master of Arts for Teachers degree from Agnes Scott College. She's a certified master naturalist and serves on the board of the Environmental Education Alliance of Georgia and also advisory council for K through 12 education at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She is passionate about wildlife and nature. She's the mother of two college students and three rescue cats. Please welcome Melanie Furr. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm so delighted to be here uh, and have this opportunity to share a little bit about uh, hummingbirds and Georgia Audubon's very own hummingbird ambassador, Sibley, will be joining us uh, later on in the presentation. So thank you for having me. I'm going to share my screen and tonight I am going to take you through a year in the life of a hummingbird. So right now, how many of you have them at your feeders? I do. Yeah, we're, we're kind of in the peak of breeding season right now. So they, a lot of people um, question why the, the hummingbirds seem to be scarce at their feeders this time of year. They're, they're busy uh, tending young and with the breeding season. So they tend to stay away from our feeders at this time of year, but they'll be coming back soon. So a year in the life of a hummingbird. And I wanna just take a moment to speak a little bit about Georgia Audubon. I don't know if any of you tuning in tonight are members, but if you are, thank you. We're very glad to have you as a member of the flock. For those of you that may not be familiar with our work, uh, we are formerly Atlanta Audubon, but beginning last August, we have expanded our role statewide uh, and trying to expand our mission to protect Georgia's birds and their habitats across Georgia. We have a lot of free guided field trips around the Metro Atlanta area. You can check out our website for those. All you need to do uh, is register and show up with a pair of binoculars. You don't have to be a member. Anyone is, is welcome to join us. They're in various locations around the city. There are a few on the south side. I know most of you are probably tuning in from south of town. We have a bunch of uh, in-person and virtual nature workshops, bird workshops. Our master birder program runs a couple times a year. Uh, we have a lot of you know, fun volunteer opportunities, uh, fun monthly meetings that are open to anyone with great speakers. So I invite you to check out our website and learn more and become a member of our flock. I like to have all my pre presentations start with just a moment of reflection about why do birds matter? Why do they uh, make a difference to our planet and to our you know, health and wellness? So there are you know, so many reasons and I don't know if people can unmute themselves and tune in. I would love to have some audience participation Can you think of some roles that birds play in the environment that maybe benefit 
their ecosystems or the humans that live in them? They sing their songs in the morning and make me happy to wake up. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Yes, they sing songs. Um, they delight us with their songs and also their colors, their diversity. They're one of the easiest ways that, that we can walk out just right outside our door and connect with wildlife. You know, other than birds, we might see squirrels and maybe occasionally if we're lucky, we'll spot a fox or a raccoon or a rabbit. But birds are all around us in many shapes and forms. So uh, they delight us. What are some other ways that birds matter to the planet? Can you think of some ecosystem or environmental services that they provide? They eat the bugs that eat my plants. Awesome, yeah. So we don't have to spray our plants with you know, pesticides if, if we just let the birds do their job and they're very good at doing it. Controlling insect pests and all kinds of pests. Um, what other kind of pests do birds control? Think bigger, birds of prey. We have hawks in our backyard, Melanie, that eat uh, some chipmunks and some field mice. Great. So yeah, you know, our hawks and our owls and our falcons are keeping all sorts of rodents um, in balance, things that otherwise can overpopulate and tend to, you know, more often carry disease. So birds are helping to you know, sanitize and balance our ecosystem. Can you think of another bird that helps to sanitize our environment? Um, the buzzards. Yes. Eating the roadkill. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, vultures. In Georgia, we have black and turkey vultures that are yeah. eating all the dead stuff that it otherwise is, you know, lying there, festering, spreading germs, attracting those rodents and insects. Uh, so we're so thankful to the vultures for cleaning, cleaning that up for us. Um, you know, at any given time, a, a friend of mine who's an ecology professor put together some roadkill studies. And at any given time, there's millions of pounds of carrion uh, on the ground. So thank you to the vultures. <laughs> Tonight's pro, uh, presentation is gonna focus on hummingbirds. What service are they providing? Mm, I don't know, what can I think of? Pollination, right? We oh, right. Our gardens and fly from flower to flower. And it's not just our, you know, ornamentals that they pollinate, they pollinate flowers on trees, flowers on bushes and shrubs and, and berries. Um, so all kinds of uh, pollination is happening thanks to our, our hummingbirds. Anything else anyone wants to add? Well, they're very, they're very entertaining. They are very entertaining. In the Atlanta area alone, we can see over 250 species um, and you know such diversity from wading birds and waterfowl to the, the raptors, um, all the different songbirds. So I have a, a list. It doesn't begin to be exhaustive, but uh, it's a pretty good list. They add to biodiversity. They're important ecosystem engineers. That is an animal that creates habitat for other animals. Can you think of, of a bird family that creates habitat for other animals? Hmm. I'll give a hint. Woodpecker. They create their cavities. They only use them to raise their young. Then they're gone and the, the squirrels, the flying squirrels, the smaller little birds like the chickadees that don't have a beak that can excavate a cavity can make good use of those homes. They're on all seven continents and all seven seas, I would add. So no matter where we go in the world, birds are outside, you know, providing these services and out, out there to delight us um, and spark our curiosity. They disperse seeds and pollinate flowers. We didn't mention seed dispersal uh, and they do that in a variety of ways. You know, they cache seeds, they'll in the fall gather and bury them Blue jays and crows bury hundreds of acorns, helping with forest regeneration. Uh, other birds eat things like berries and can't digest the seeds, so they fly off and disperse them out the other end, uh, already fertilized. So they're providing dispersal services as well. 
They're part of the cleanup crew, control pests, biological indicators, the canaries in the coal mine. They're very sensitive to environmental change. And the fact that they're declining uh, at an alarming rate, we've lost um, nearly 3 billion birds from the planet in the last 50 years, um, that, that should concern us. Source of beauty and inspiration. They're a great platform for teaching and they add economic value. All that pollination, pest control, seed dispersal, it adds up to billions of dollars worth of services free of charge that they provide each year. But tonight we're going to focus on maybe one of the most mystical, magical birds. It's the smallest bird on the planet. And uh, in Georgia, we only have one species of this bird. Does everyone know what species we have in Georgia? Ruby Call throat it out or throw it in the chat. I see some people mouthing, yeah, the ruby-throated <laughs> hummingbird. So even though you may see birds at your feeders that look different um, in different lights during, you know, from March through October, the ruby-throated hummingbird is gonna be the only species that you'll see in Georgia. And up top mm. here, we have the male with his, you know, vibrant iridescent ruby throat. The female does not have the ruby color. She has a white throat. And down here on the bottom, we have a juvenile male. So this is a first year male that hasn't quite gotten his uh, ruby bling yet. You can just see you know, one or two little sparkles there. The reason why the females don't have that bright color, um, be thinking about that because I'm gonna ask you about that. So here we have again, a male and a female. And here is their range map. So the peachy pink color is their breeding uh, range where they spend you know, the breeding season again from March through October. The yellow is their migration route for some of them. And we'll talk more about their migration. And then for the winter, they're down here in this blue range. So down here in the tropics and they get as far down as Panama, um, but they, most of them, the great majority of them are wintering uh, in Mexico and Costa Rica, a lot of them in the Yucatan Peninsula right here. So does anyone want to tell me why it's the male that has the vibrant ruby throat and why the female does not? Which is true in the bird world 99% of the time that it's gonna be the male that has the flashier color, whereas the female is gonna be more muted to blend in with her environment. Why do you think that would be? You wanna have a guess? Well, for protection, isn't it? Um, more attraction to the male and uh, keep the, the female and the nest and young safe? Yes, so the female is gonna be spending more time at the nest. She's laying the eggs. She does most of the incubation. Depending on the species, you know, dad will do some incubation and will do some feeding and care of the young, um, but mom's spending more time at the nest. So she doesn't wanna have bright colors flying back and forth, flagging predators to her nest. So females tend to be more muted. The males have that vibrant ruby throat. And we're gonna kind of go through a year. So we're gonna start in March when the males are arriving and they, are arrive, they arrive first because they wanna set up the best breeding ter territories so that the females will want you know, to come and, and raise young there. So the males tend to show up late March, early April in Georgia with the females following a couple weeks behind. And then when they get there, the males, it's all about you know, impressing the girls. And in this short clip here, I have, there's a female, you can hardly see her, but she's perched on the feeder and there's a male hovering over her um, trying to impress her with his, oops, his, his colors and his acrobatic flight. So hummingbirds are the only birds in the world that can truly hover. Other birds can manage it for short periods of time by flying into the wind or 
um, you know, flapping a certain way, but hummingbirds by flapping their wings in a figure eight pattern can, can hover indefinitely and they're the only birds that can do that. And if you're lucky to ever see this in the wild, it can be quite dramatic. The male will make these sweeping wide arcs, you know, in a, in a wide U shape, kind of his wings are going so fast, they're making that humming sound that they're named for. I have another short clip here. This is not a ruby throat, um, but it's just a very um, spectacular clip of a male displaying for a female. This is a Costa's hummingbird. Spring is the time to nest before the desert gets too hot. Both birds are looking for a partner. But the choice of mate will be hers. It's up to him to impress her. He moves in close, hovering directly in front of her, rocking his entire <laughs> body back and forth in a display of flying prowess. Though his back shimmers with green, it's not until we get her point of view that we see his true splendor. <laughs> he flexes the iridescent feathers of his mantle until they become a glowing mask of violence. <laughs> So if you're lucky and you, you really, you know, watch and pay attention to your birds and your hummingbirds, you might get to see a ruby throat doing something very similar. Uh, it's, it's quite dramatic. But those flashing colors that they show are actually not, um, they're just a trick of the light. There's actually no color there at all. In this top photo, we have a um, up close microscope, um, through a microscope photo of one of Sibley's feathers. And the actual color of the feather is, you know, a dark gray, almost black, sort of a, you know, brown gray. And then when you see it in the light, it can take on, you know, hues of gold or orange. Sometimes it even looks green. But, you know, most often on the ruby throat, we see those ruby colors, obviously, that they're named for. But the feathers actually have, um, you know, this, these microscopic structures, these, these gaps of air in the, in the feather structure that are scattering the light. Uh, and it's actually that refraction of light that allows us to see the colors, similar to a rainbow or the colors on a soap bubble, but they, they don't really um, have any pigmented colors there at all. So here's a little video of Sibley showing us his fine colors. And you'll notice, so here's the actual color of the feather, this, this black, dark color almost. And as he turns into the light, you'll see how it really can shine, like a light has been turned on. There he's turned on. There he's turned off. <laughs> So if the male is successful in flashing those colors and impressing the girls with his moves, uh, his, his job is done. He plays no further role in um, 
you know, bringing the next generation uh, into the world. So the female takes on all the work. She builds the nest. She'll spend you know, about 10 days, roughly, building the nest, gathering soft plant fibers, grasses. She'll bind it together with spider webs. Very good reason to leave those cobwebs on your porch, the corners of your porch. Uh, and then she'll decorate the outside with lichen, as you can see, to camouflage it. These nests are often on a horizontal branch. And you know, because of that camouflage with the lichen, they'll just look like a little knot uh, on the tree limb. The key on this nest here is just to give you a sense of scale. So as you can see, very tiny. They will lay two jelly bean sized eggs. Um, with, without, you know, almost without exception. The female again is gonna do all of the work um, incubating the eggs. She sits on the eggs for about three weeks uh, and then she does all of the child care. So the young are in the nest for about three weeks. So from start to finish, um, she's, you know, investing a good, um, you know, three weeks on the nest, three weeks of child care, and then three weeks out of the nest. Um, we're talking about almost three months of child care that she provides, but still very accelerated. Uh, when you think of how long it takes to, to raise a human child. So mom will fly around and she'll feed on insects and drink nectar from flowers. And then she'll fly back and insert her bill down their throat into a, a pouch called the crop and uh, regurgitate a, you know, a slurry mixture. Here's a video that a friend of mine took of mom coming in to feed. So you'll notice as she lands, the young perk up and those mouths are opened. You'll notice they have short little beaks. Of course, that helps them fit in those jelly bean size eggs, but it also facilitates feeding in those early days. And their gape is bright yellow, helping that, you know, sort of a flag for mom, triggering her to you know, feed me, feed me. So she has filled up her crop and then she comes back and, and feeds it to her, her young. And you'll notice after she flies off a very interesting programmed behavior. Once they're done, they stick their backsides over the side of the nest um, to eject their waste. So almost from birth, they are programmed to, to lift their little hineys over the side of the nest so that they don't soil their nest. So as I said, mom feeds them in the nest for about three weeks. Uh, then she will continue to fly around and feed them out of the nest for another few weeks. Here's a picture of a bird that I helped care for in rehab. You heard in my bio that I also do wildlife rehabilitation. So you can get a great look at that you know, wide yellow gape that the babies have. And of course, you know, they do end up on the ground sometimes. It doesn't necessarily mean they're orphaned or abandoned. Sometimes they, you know, might just need a helping hand to a safe spot. But mom, because she, you know, she can hover and fly in any direction, can, you know, get to them and, and continue to feed them once they leave the nest. So once the babies are out of the nest, you know, we're into midsummer now. And it's all about, you know, fattening up and getting ready to leave again in the fall. So in the summer, they are eating, 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 and they have incredible metabolism. Uh, a lot of people are surprised to learn that they don't survive on nectar alone. They, they can't live on just sugar. Uh, and so they do fly around and catch insects on the wing. They open their bills really wide and they gulp those insects down. They, of course, love coming to our feeders, and I'll talk about the best mixture to put in your feeders at the end. But their metabolism is so remarkable um, that if we could process the sugars and the calories that they process in a day, um, we would be drinking uh, Coke every single minute for 12 hours a day. <laughs> mm. 
So here's a picture of Sibley uh, when he had just come to me. And that's the only reason I can age Sibley, who you'll be meeting momentarily. Um, he had been injured in a window collision. And so he was a juvenile bird. He just had a couple of ruby speckles, but he was molting. And so you can see where he has filled his crop, that extra pouch that it comes before the stomach that I mentioned that helps them be able to fill up on as much food as they can find uh, in case they, they get chased off from a flower patch or you know, the nectar runs dry for a feeding. So uh, they have this neat uh, anatomical feature called a crop. They of course have an amazing tongue which allows them to get into those deep tubular flowers that they like best. Uh, and their tongue is, as you can see, twice as long as their bill and to fit inside their mouth that it has to wrap around their skull. So they've got a special apparatus at the back of their skull that allows their, their tongue to wrap around their head. Here's Sibley catching a spider. He can't fly after uh, you know, sustaining a wing injury in a window collision. But if a spider dangles in front of him, he's ready to gobble it right up. So you can get a good idea of how wide their mouths can open. He knows when he sees that I'm bringing a twig that a little treat is coming. So you can see he's really attuned to what's coming. It's hard, the spider's on a web, so it, it blows in the wind. It sometimes takes a minute for him to get it. But that's a pretty, that's regular summer enrichment for Sibley is, is catching spiders. So I, I let all the spiders be on my porch because we need those for hummingbird enrichment. And then of course, aside from feeding, a, a big part of a hummingbird's um, daily routine is self-care. And obviously in this video, in the wild, they would accomplish bathing much the same way, but they would be able to fly and hover and sort of shimmy over wet leaves. Um, you know, they would, they would enjoy a light rain and being out in a light rain. Uh, but I often see the hummingbirds that are in my yard in the first thing in the morning when the leaves are wet with dew, they are shimmying around, you know, flying from leaf to leaf and it just sliding around on them. It's very entertaining to watch. Sibley really loves his bath too. And then preening. Here Sibley's molting. So you'll notice some sort of prickly white feathers on around his face. And those are called pin feathers because of their, their little prickly as they're growing in. But you'll notice that he's repeatedly rubbing his bill at the base of his tail, where he has a special oil gland, a preen gland, it's called a preen gland. And so he'll get that preen oil on the tip of his Waterproof and healthy. And they'll also use their feet to sort of get their feathers in place uh, or to scratch an itch. But they're managed quite, you know, with, with such a long bill, they're, they're pretty, um, pretty acrobatic with it. So summer, you know, eating and bathing and all that fun stuff is over as the seasons start to change. The days get shorter, the leaves start to fall, food supply is starting to change. Um, and so hummingbirds have those cues that it's time to go. And again, here's their range map. So they're gonna be leaving that pink breeding territory heading down to the tropics. And those that are breeding up here in, you know, in central Canada and, and the Midwest, they might take a land route straight down through Mexico to get there. But most of the birds that are breeding on the Eastern seaboard, they're gonna take the shortest route. They're not gonna go way out of their way and cross Appalachian mountain, you know, and mountain ranges and um, go out of their way. So they're gonna fly straight down and then they sort of stage on the Gulf Coast 
where they will nearly double their weight. They only weigh about a penny. So imagine that, I mean, as little as a penny weighs. Uh, and they'll nearly double it, so maybe as much as a nickel. And, and then they make a trans-Gulf migration, a non-stop flight across the Gulf of Mexico. So it's more than 500 miles of flying with no place to stop, no place to refuel, no place to rest. Uh, pretty astounding uh, when you think about how tiny these birds are. So as I mentioned, they're going to double their weight. They're going to really fatten up uh, when they're making that leap across the Gulf. And then by the time they get to the other end, you know, they will have lost that weight. They will, they will have burned all that energy and they'll be relying on good habitat right when they get there. Those, those habitats are important on both ends. Alan, it looks like Melanie's video cut out. Yeah, we might have lost her. We had a bad storm come through here on Lower Fayetteville. Yeah, I that's. Have, I have one here at the office too. It's 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 pretty bad outside. Yeah. Let's see. Hopefully, she'll be able to get back on. Which that be talking about? Am I alive? You are. I'd like to recognize we have Robert Myers in the audience tonight. He's quite a bird guy himself from Carroll County. And uh, he did a program for us last year and did a great, great job. Hope you're enjoying this, Robert. Okay, Melanie should be coming right back on. Was that just me that crashed or did, I, did everyone crash? Just you. I'm sorry about that. I don't know what okay. happened. We're having storms here. Are you having storms there? Um, the skies are dark, but no, not yet. Okay. All right. Well, it said Zoom crashed, so I was afraid the meeting had no, been lost. No, um, if you can let me share my screen. I'm on my last couple slides, and then I'm going to switch over to Sibley. Absolutely. Let me get to. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Oh, and I see I don't have my camera on yet either. Actually, you know what? We don't need the slideshow. Let's just flip, flip on over to Sibley. I will need to um, share my screen though. Okay. There we go. And I can talk about threats to hummingbirds and ways you can help while we, um, while you get a look at Sibley. So window collisions are a major one. And sadly in Atlanta, um, 
Oops. You're not seeing my, are you seeing? Sorry. In Atlanta, um, we find that hummingbirds suffer more casualties than any other species on our monitoring routes of some of the, the buildings that have um, the worst problems with bird uh, fatalities. Here we go. One second to get it. Get him in good focus. There we go. There's Sibley. Everyone can see. Yes. Is this live? This is live. Yes, he's with us. He's been waiting for his debut. Wow. Um, he's eating, as you can see right now. He's got ready access um, to nectar. And I'm going to just shake it up and plunge it here. That's my job all day long is just making sure nectar feeders are shaken and plunged uh, because he gets a special nectar that has protein and vitamins and minerals um, to try to replicate his diet mm -hmm. in the wild. As I mentioned, they can't just eat, you know, live on sugar alone. So I recommend still just the sugar water um, concoction for your feeders. But Sibley is getting a special um, special food here to keep him healthy. Mm -hmm. So window collisions are, are one. Pesticides, obviously, when we spray our gardens with pesticides, we're poisoning the food chain uh, for these guys who are eating the insects and nectaring on the flowers. Um, roaming cats, you know, sometimes we'll get these birds as well as other birds up to 2 billion a year in North America are killed by free roaming cats. And then, you know, climate change is a big threat for birds like Sibley because their migrations have been timed with, you know, the, the blooming of flowers and, and the hatching of insects over millennia. And we've changed and sped up, you know, climate over just, you know, a few hundred years. And, and we, some birds may be able to adapt, but others may not. Hummingbirds are obviously relying on, on flowers being in bloom and, and um, insects hatching and flying when they you know, return to North America and vice versa in the fall when they're returning to the tropics. So ways we can help, planting native plants. You know, any kind of nectar source is great for hummingbirds and for you know, other pollinators like butterflies and moths. But if you plant native, you're supporting the rest of the food chain. Um, you know, all the moths and butterflies that rely on native plants to lay their eggs. Um, you're probably very familiar with uh, the example of the monarch butterfly and milkweed. Many pollinators rely on specific native plants to raise their young. So planting native plants is a great thing that you can do uh, for birds um, who eat those insects. Hanging your feeders. And for your nectar, I recommend one part white table sugar and just your white table sugar only. You might be tempted to use organic sugar or honey, thinking it's more natural, more pure, um, but those can actually harbor fun bacteria and fungus more readily and have trace minerals that are not good uh, for hummingbirds. So just stick to your white table sugar. Uh, if you heat it, the, it extends the shelf life so it's, you know, one part of the sugar to four parts water. Uh, I just fill my feeders a little bit. I'll show you my favorite feeder here. I'll kind of slide it behind Sibley. I'm going to go slowly so he doesn't get startled. Um, this is a saucer style. And I'll just fill it, you know, not even halfway uh, so that the wasps and bees give up on it, for one, because they can't reach the nectar. And then two... Um, you know, hummingbirds in hot weather, that nectar spoils and, and we can actually make them very sick if we let it ferment. So we don't want to fill it uh, and, and leave it out a long time and letting it spoil. We want to just put a little bit uh, and change it out every day or every other day um, in hot weather. So that was, um, oh, and then one last thing about feeders. You don't have to take them down in fall. We do actually have a few 
uh, migratory species from the western parts of North America that occasionally miss the turn to the tropics and end up in Georgia for the winter. Uh, so you might see a rufous hummingbird or a calliope hummingbird. Uh, we've had records of um, flat chinned and broad billed hummingbirds in Georgia. So, you know, feel free to leave your feeders out. Just keep your nectar fresh. And thank you again for, for joining tonight. So it is. And I hope you'll check out georgiaaudubon.org and then learn more about ways you can get involved and join us at uh, some of our gatherings. Uh, and, you know, Sibley and I are resuming live visits now. So <laughs> we hope to meet you sometime in person too. And I've, I've got plenty of time for questions if we've got uh, any lingering questions. Uh, yeah. Melanie, how long have you had Sibley and what is the average lifespan of a hummingbird? So Sibley was injured three years ago this summer and he came to me in the fall of 2018. So soon after he was injured, um, I had to wait for the perm to get the permit. It's a pretty extensive uh, permitting process if you want to take on the care of a wild bird. Uh, and you know you can't do it just for any reason. You have to have, um, you know, either for education or for scientific study. But after I was permitted, Sibley came to me in September of 2018, mm. and so he, oh, sorry, has been with me almost three years now. And the average life expectancy of a hummingbird is three years. So we're delighted that, you know, Sibley is coming up on his third birthday. To our knowledge, Sibley is the only education hummingbird ambassador um, in the world. So we, there's no precedent that we know of, of how long um, he might be with us. But he had a full molt, molt uh, this winter and early spring which is the time that hummingbirds in the wild, they'll, they'll replace um, a lot of their feathers on their wintering ground. So they come back ready to breed. And Sibley replaced all his feathers this winter and early spring, as I said, um, which is a good sign of health. So we hope he'll be with us a while longer. You can see a little of his waist there, just right in front of the bracelet. So they, you know, it's just a tiny little speck. <laughs> but that's, you know, his care is making sure that he can uh, have, act. he does actually get around. I've got lots of different perches in his enclosure, which I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. It's empty right now for cleaning but he sits in a sunny window and there's lots of plants around. So he gets to look at my bird feeders and feel um, like he's, you know, living in a green place. And he spends lots of time outside on my porch. But he has lots of different perches because he spends a lot of time on his feet. So one of the concerns for hummingbirds in captivity is that their feet will, you know, start to have trouble. So I've got a lot of different perches with different widths and textures. Um, and he manages to sidestep and flutter and hop from perch to perch. So he manages pretty well. We saw the video of him bathing. So uh, he really uh, enjoys his daily routine. He seems to be a pretty content little bird. Hey, Melanie, we have some questions in the chat room. Sure. Okay. Um, from John Eisenhower, uh, he says, I know that one to four is best, but I have heard that it should be weight so it is always the same. But one to four volume is very weak and dependent on sugar grain size. Just what's your opinions and thought or thoughts on this? Well, I would think by volume, you know, one 
option one cup depend well I, I i could see the point yeah there would be more air maybe with the larger grain size um i'm i can't say i have any sort of expertise in that area um but i know that the people that have done you know the most studies on wild hummingbirds um their recommendation is one to four so yeah. that is what, what i would recommend yes okay and also from linda pollock uh, what plants do you recommend for hummingbirds? She says that uh, she's a bad feeder keeper, and so she'd like to plant plants so she doesn't have to constantly fill her, her feeder. Yeah, and planting plants is really the best way. If you're having a, a lush garden with lots of you know nectar and also uh, insect populations is the best way to support your birds. So some of my favorite plants for hummingbirds are coral honeysuckle which is a native honeysuckle. Um, it's bright red, it's spectacular. There's bee balm, um, jewelweed. There's probably others that other people that are gardeners on the program can share. So feel free to share those in the chat. Well, or, I, I have observed in my yard, the hummingbirds absolutely favor the blue salvia. Salvias, um, yes, and I know pineapple sage, which is not a native. Pineapple sage, yeah. We love but, it. But the blue salvia is their absolute favorite in my yard. Um, columbines, there's some lovely wild columbines that are native. And um, cardinal flower is another one I just thought of, which is great for hummingbirds and is a native. That's right. Okay, from Deborah Matheson, and I think this has been touched on but in case it has not been clarified, what is the average lifespan uh, of a hummingbird? It's three in the wild. Um, you know, a lot of them don't survive their first year. Mortality is very high the first year. And things will eat the eggs, things will eat the young in the nest. Um, a lot of them don't, you know, they fly, they leave the nest before they're quite ready to fly and might get caught by a ground predator. Um, but the average lifespan is three. And I believe the oldest recaptured um, banded ruby-throated hummingbird was nine or 10. So those that sort of figure it out and yeah. get the best territories um, and are successful can live a remarkably long time for a bird with such a hard demanding life, yeah. um, you know, with the migration on top of that. Yes. Okay, and from Dana Hallberg, uh, what is their sleep schedule that are, um, yeah. Uh, they go to bed with the sun. Uh, they do not feed at night. So sundown, they go to bed. Sibley's does not require care at night. I bring him sugar water at night, actually, because the nectar um, that he gets that has the, the protein and um, all the other things that he needs has a shorter shelf life. So at night, I deliver sugar water which won't spoil overnight. And it's been really interesting to note that he does have taste preferences. Uh, he loves the sugar water. His crop uh, will start to bulge when he has the sugar water. And he likes uh, the nectar just fine. He drinks it fine. But once a day, I also grind up fruit flies and stick those, put those in the nectar and he likes that decidedly less. <laughs> Okay, that's all the questions that we have in the uh, chat. Ellen, Ellen scroll up to the top. There's some more. Oh, am I going the right way? <laughs> Can you go up to the top? Okay, let me mm -hmm. try this one more time. Okay, uh, it's... Well, these are just comments. I love watching them. No. Uh, I, I don't see any new ones there, Deborah. There's the Larry Olson. Some of, and people can feel free to ask their questions too if they didn't yeah. get seen in the chat. Okay, I don't see Larry's. <clears throat> this is why are there so few hummingbirds in the spring? Seems like most of them die during migration. 
all our work feeding them and their numbers don't seem to permanently increase any statistics on population changes? That's a great question and I get it a lot um, because people are so, you know, they the last time they saw hummingbirds, there were so many coming through and then in the spring they, they like don't see as many and in the summer they become even scarcer. So in the spring, um, you know, you just have the returning adults um, coming back and they'll pass through Georgia, but a lot of them are gonna keep moving as you saw all the way up to Canada. Um, so if they're not setting up a breeding territory in your yard, you're likely, you know, they're not likely to linger. And then by summer, once they're on territory, again, if, if you don't have a pair breeding, you probably won't see many. But starting in late July and, you know, August and September into October, you've got the adults returning plus all of their offspring. Um, and so they're all coming through. And that's when you can see, you know, that's when you'll see the most. That's when you'll start seeing the hummingbird wars at your feeders. So yeah, just wait till late July, August. Um, and then, you know, late August, early September seems to be when they really peak. All right, um, Melanie, I have a question from Gina Gross. Um, in reference to they're attracted, are they attracted to red colors? It's one question then. And, and also, do we get the same birds year after year? Sometimes we think we have the same ones. Okay, both great questions. So yes, they are attracted to red, uh, but also pink and purple. And they'll also learn, you know, if a white or a yellow flower has lots of nectar, they'll, they'll use that too. Um, they've got amazing vision and you know, red really stands out with that contrast with the green landscape uh, below oftentimes. So, they, you know, red colors kind of will get their, their attention, but they all nectar from any flower that, that, offers, that offers the nectar. Um, and then the second part of the question, remind me, um, oh, if they come back year after yes. year. So I have a great anecdote to share that it just shows the how remarkable um, the site fidelity of these birds is. So yes, the an short answer is yes, they do return. If they've successfully bred in a site, um, they will return there. Their offspring won't return right there, you know, where their mom and dad are, but the offspring will disperse maybe 30 or 40, 30 or 40 miles away. Um, but anecdotally, we have a member who had a Rufus hummingbird show up at her feeder it was October or early November. And that's pretty unusual to have a Rufus hummingbird show up and stay the winter. So it was banded by the Georgia Hummer Study Group. Um, and that individual returned to that same neighborhood in Grant Park. So, you know, down, down by the zoo, um, pretty urban landscape, Atlanta, five years in a row. And they know it because they could see the little silver band on its ankle, mm. um, but same feeder, you know, Pretty faithfully that same week, whenever it was in October, November, that bird showed up. And our ruby throats, you know, are the same. They, they will return to, to good territory year after year. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have. Melanie, it's been a fascinating presentation. Uh, I know we've all benefited and just thoroughly enjoyed the program. And we all look forward to maybe hearing from you and Sydney uh, as time goes by. We know that, uh, uh, that you know, nothing lasts forever. But uh, I wish you would communicate with me and or in our county extension office with Karen uh, regarding Sydney and how things are going. Well, thanks for having me, and I appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Enjoy the rest of your Thank meeting. You. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. It was wonderful.